Dear friends, good evening and welcome to Temple Emmanuel. I'm Rabbi Joshua Davidson on, on behalf of our, well, that's very nice, thank you very much. But I know I'm not the one you came to hear. On behalf of our Stryker Center and its director, Dr. Gotti Levy, I thank you for joining us for the first of two important nights. Synagogues have a long history of holding forums for candidates or their parties in anticipation of consequential elections. And with one on the near horizon, with so much at stake for America and for the Jewish community, we chose to host two evenings for representatives of the Democratic and Republican parties to speak about their vision for the future of our country. We invited the Jewish Democratic Council of America and the Republican Jewish Coalition to select the individuals they felt could best make their party's case, interview them, and then take your questions from the note cards that you've been handed that our staff will collect later. Next Monday at 7 o'clock, we will hear from Republican Lee Zeldin, former congressman from New York's 1st Congressional District in Suffolk County. For their part, the Jewish Democratic Council of America went right to the top. And tonight, we are truly honored to welcome <laughs> the governor of the state of New York, Kathy Hochul. Prior to becoming the first woman ever to hold that position, she was New York's lieutenant governor. And before that, she represented the state's 26th congressional district in the House. And we are deeply grateful for her presence tonight. She will be joined in conversation with Haley Seufer, the Jewish Democratic Council of America's CEO. Prior to joining the JDCA, Haley served for nearly two decades as a national security advisor in the Obama administration and to four members of Congress, including then Senator, now Vice President, Kamala Harris. Please welcome Haley Seufer and Governor Kathy Hochul. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone for being here. Thanks to the Stryker Center. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, I'm Haley Seufer, and I run the Jewish Democratic Council of America, which, thank you, which is the voice and political home of Jewish voters in support of Democrats who share our values. It's a critically important organization at a critically important time. And we're so honored to be joined by you, Governor Hochul, one such Democrat, to talk about the stakes of this election. So in 41 days, and yes, we are counting, we will have an election and determine which party not only holds power in the White House, but the Senate and the House. And at JDCA, we are making sure that Jewish Americans understand what's at stake in this election and the deep contrast between the candidates. On the one hand, we have Vice President Harris, who has consistently stood with the Jewish community on every issue of importance to Jewish voters, including defending democracy and reproductive rights, combating anti-Semitism, and support of Israel. On the other hand, we have a candidate who is aspiring to be a dictator. He has told us he would like to be a dictator on day one. He's denigrated millions of Jewish American voters almost incessantly at this point. He praised Hezbollah, said they were very smart after October 7th. He has said Israel's survival is contingent on his election win. And he has preemptively blamed the Jewish people, all of us, if he loses in November. So in your view, what do you think is at stake in this election? <laughs> for Jewish voters. And how do you describe the contrast between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump on the key issues that are driving the Jewish vote, defending our democracy, our reproductive rights, countering anti-Semitism, and support of Israel? Haley, the way you phrase that, the answer, what is at stake? The question, what is at stake? Everything is at stake. Life as we know it is at stake. Democracy is at stake. Women's rights are at stake. 
and the fate of Israel is at stake because this is a guy who has no trouble inviting the most horrible anti-Semitic people on this planet to dinner at Mar-a-Lago. So, so let's just frame it as extreme as it is. And I'm so grateful to have an organization like the council. And so to harness the power of the Jewish vote and propel it in the right direction, or maybe the left direction, um, is something that's quite extraordinary. So thank you for your leadership there. Thank you, Rabbi Davidson, for allowing us to be in this magnificent space on this uh, rather hectic night in this part of our state as we welcome people from all over the globe. But I will say this, Haley, what's at stake is not just the rights of Americans, but also the world is watching. Uh, the prime ministers I have met who's come to solicit my opinion as they come from all over the world, asking me as the governor of New York, what is happening in your election? There is a genuine fear that somehow Donald Trump could find his way back into the White House, and that'll disrupt the world order as we know it. So there is so much at stake, and it's in our hands to save this country. And we have the power to do that. We absolutely do. So to dig in a little more on the election, the path to taking back the House runs through New York. Democrats need to net just five House seats to win back the majority. And if we elect Democrats like Laura Gillen, John Avalon, John Mannion, Mondaire Jones, and Josh Riley, well, right there, that's five. We could secure the Democratic majority and hand the gavel, the Speaker's gavel, to another New Yorker, the next Speaker of the House, Hakeem Jeffries. We at JDCA are hosting phone banks, text banks, we're doing canvases, and larger campaigns to mobilize the Jewish community around the country, and particularly in swing states and districts, and yes, you have five here in New York. Can you talk to us about the significance of these New York House races and what we can all be doing to ensure that Democrats win back the majority in the House? I'd be very happy to talk about what we're doing and what others can be doing as well. As you pointed out, we have the power to pick up these five seats as well as hold Pat Ryan and to hold Tom Suozzi, and we can break that stranglehold that Republicans have now had from Long Island all the way up through the Hudson Valley. We also have a seat over in Syracuse, and you named everybody. I'm very impressed, uh, but these are names of people I speak to all the time that I'm working so hard for, and how am I doing that? I am the leader of the New York State Democratic Party. For a long time, that didn't mean anything because no one sees the power that was sitting right there to be used to help other candidates. It was always used as the vehicle to help the governor every four years, but it shut down when the governor's race was over and nobody tapped into the ability to use this to help others. I know about this because 30 years ago this year, I was first elected to local office. I was a council member. Then I ran for county office, and then I ran for Congress uh, back in 2011 in a special election. I've never had help from the state party. It never offered to us and said no every time I asked. And I knew as governor, my first year I had been governor, just you know, unexpectedly, as you know the story. Um, <laughs> can't write a book about this. I won't write any books. Um, I also knew that there's people counting on me as the leader of this party. The local races, the down ballot races, and we shouldn't only be paying attention when it's only congressional and others because I'm building up the farm team. I started last year by raising money. I'm doing call time, asking donors, generous people to help me build up the state party. Now I have the resources starting last year to put money into these races. I have raised more working with Hakeem Jeffries and Kirsten Gillibrand, who's on the ballot, my great friend, the three of us have said, let's make this impactful. So as a result, I just got the results a couple hours ago. We now have 1.6 million voter contacts in those only, only those handful of districts. We've opened 40 field offices, averaging three to four to five in all these races. That's never happened before. I've hired over 100 people directly the coordinators on the ground, the constituency outreach, the campus outreach. So 
we're making it the powerhouse in a short time because I know how to do this. And so that's what I'm doing to make sure that we take back the house. And what others can do, support the state party because I can accept contributions at much higher levels than individual candidates. If you've given individual candidates, and you all should, um, help the state party because I can use that as an umbrella organization to build the teams from the ground up. But also, use your own voices, your social media platforms, your own contacts. I mean, everybody has a stake in this. It's not just the candidates. It's not just those of us who, who are in politics. Every American should care deeply about this race and to figure out how they can touch others. The trusted messengers is what I would say. You know, synagogues are a place like that. Jewish organizations are a place like that. The platforms that you use to communicate about other issues, there's nothing else we talked about for the next few days, for the next couple of months, never next couple of months, couple of weeks, than this election. And Hakeem Jeffries must become the speaker, and here's why. Two dynamics. One is the doomsday scenario, the most dreaded thing that could happen. And somehow America's the good people don't come out to vote, and the people who want a dictator to lead them do. Okay, Imagine that scenario. We need the House representatives to be a firewall to stop the most horrific things from happening. You need to do this. I know about this because when I went to Congress, I was in the Republican minority with John Boehner as speaker when Barack Obama was president, right? Barack Obama could not get much through. He did his first two years when he had a Democratic House and Senate. Then that changed. He was paralyzed. He couldn't do much more. I lost my seat because I supported the Affordable Care Act. I lost my seat in the most Republican district in the state of New York by one and a half points because I voted 43 times not to repeal the Affordable Care Act. So we need to have a Democratic House to stop Donald Trump if he gets in, but President Harris needs a Democratic House to get her agenda through. I mean, we love what she wants to do. We support her, whether it's economic security for all, whether it's her, her desire to help small businesses get started, to help families who are struggling. She can't get that through if she has a Republican House. So either way, my friends, it comes down to the House and the Senate, and that's why I am so laser focused on this, living and breathing this. I can't tell you how, how compulsive I am about this outcome because it means everything, not just for us, but for your kids, all the way down to my little two-year-old granddaughter. We have to do this for, the, for generations to come. I agree with you. We are also laser focused and we have been focused uh, on elections and, and you had a very interesting special election earlier this year in New York. We, we all remember the former Congressman Jewish, George Santos, uh, who had a rather unfortunate departure. But as there was a special election. JDCA got very involved in that special election earlier this year in New York. That district was 11% Jewish. We sent ads and we got out the vote among the Jewish voters of that district, Democrats, independents, and Republicans. And they saw those ads on average about 54 times before that special election. Interestingly, our ads focused on abortion, which 88% of Jewish Americans believe should be legal in all or some cases. We know Jewish voters can make the difference. They did in that race. They did in the primary recently, which unseated a Democratic incumbent. And we know we will continue to make a difference in November. What is something we can learn from that special election where we flipped a seat from red to blue as we look toward November? Well, I certainly know all about that election. Uh, um, Tom Swazi and I had a little different experience in 2022 when he was running against me in a primary. Uh, but uh, I'll let bygones be got bygones. I was raised in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and I'm a Catholic, and I know all about forgiveness, and uh, I forgave him. So, because I knew, despite what had happened in my own election, and, you know, the way I had to fight off a pretty intense challenge, which then it made it more difficult in November. You know, when you spend $30 million in a primary, it's a little harder to dust yourself off and win again. So, but I knew what was at stake was the fate of this country. 
I needed to at least have that one pickup right there to start the trend that we're going to continue this November. Tom had to win. So we've become the strongest of allies. And the help that you gave him was extraordinary. And don't underestimate the power that you were able to exert. Those ads mean everything. Every time an organization can put up an ad on behalf of candidates, it's one less dollar they have to raise for themselves to go on the air, and they can put into the ground game. They can help pay for those offices and the literature and, and the volunteers to, and the people being hired. So, so having lived through this, um, I've been in 15 elections myself. All that extra air cover helps so much. But the issues he leaned into, one was abortion. And in a state like New York, when I was running, abortion was on the ballot in a number of states. And this was, you know, it was a hot button issue. It was right after uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned. It just didn't resonate in New York at the time because no one really, really believed in a state like New York that the right to an abortion was in jeopardy. So it didn't catch on in New York as a political asset for turning out Democrats and, and independents to vote the way it did in other, other states. But by the time we came around to this special election and people saw the damage that had been done and starting to see that there were young women dying in states that half of America, 22 states, now have restrictions on abortion, people started saying, you know what, that could happen in New York. We do have to stand up for this. So I think the tide has even shifted that people have a greater anxiety about losing that right because... I grew up at a time when you absolutely took it for granted. My mother fought for that. I benefited. My daughter doesn't have it any now anymore. So there's, that was the timing issue, which I think is important. It exists now. And the way we could lean into that was so important for Tom to be elected. And he also wasn't afraid to talk about immigration. Uh, those are the issues that are being weaponized against Democrats. Right now, the ads are all over. And they're blaming Kamala Harris for everything. And also for Democrats. But... All you have to do is stand up and say, wait a minute, President Biden worked in a bipartisan way with one of the most conservative senators and found an answer to deal with the border. It would have dealt with ensuring that people had to apply for asylum before they came, more money for border patrol and other resources for cities like New York that have had a, you know, an enormous cost dealing with the migrants, you know, formerly $4 billion from the state of New York alone. So he talked about that in a way that said the Republicans had the ability to solve this, and they refused. So they own this issue now. There was a plan. They stopped it only because Donald Trump did not want Joe Biden and the Democrats to say they solved this. If that's not the most cynical, crass play I've ever seen in politics, we could have solved this by now. And he wouldn't do it because it might help his opponent. And Tom was able to talk about that in his election as well. But thank you, thank you, thank you for what you did there. And for George Latimer, a great friend of mine, we worked together battling the pandemic. And I've seen him, uh, I spent eight years as lieutenant governor. I know every county, and he's been a great leader in Westchester. And he'll be an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, friend of the Jewish community and a great supporter of Israel when he gets elected to Congress. So that is a huge win for us. Absolutely. Thank you. So JDCA was founded in the aftermath of the Unite the Right rally, when we saw white supremacists, neo-Nazis, marching in Charlottesville, and of course at the time we had a president who equated them with peaceful protesters, saying there were very fine people on both sides. It was the same great replacement theory that they were shouting, Jews will not replace us, that spurred a deadly, the deadliest attack on American Jews that we've seen in our history at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh that motivated that perpetrator there. Just last week, we heard Donald Trump preemptively blame the Jewish people for his potential election loss, scapegoating us all. Well, he wasn't distinguishing between Democrats and Republicans. And according to the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism includes, this is a quote, accusing Jews as a people of being responsible for real or imagined wrongdoing. So again, according to the definition, this was anti-Semitic. And of course, his words are incredibly dangerous. I'm interested in how you view 
Donald Trump's recent threats that he has made, whether it's disparaging millions of us who support Democrats or his preemptive threat against the Jewish people. It's dangerous. It is fundamentally dangerous to put a target on the Jewish people and to blame them for anything. He's saying that if he loses his election, it's the fault of the Jewish people. Therefore, they're targeted. So he knows better than to do that. That is, words matter. Look at January 6th. Words matter. People act on your words. So what he did was abhorrent. And I will tell you this. As the leader of a state that represents the largest Jewish population outside of Israel, I know that we have to do more in this state. It's what I have control over. We've adopted the definition of anti-Semitism here in the state of New York. We've taken a lot of steps we'll talk about during the course of the evening. But it's not surprising he would do that, but it is something that law enforcement needs to be aware of because I think there's an extra target now, and I, I find that frightening. I really find that frightening because people act on those words. And you know whether it's white supremacist attacking the Jewish community, a you know, tree of life, what has happened there, or the people who are radicalized online, a white supremacist who, lives in, who lived in New York, who went after my hometown of Buffalo and slaughtered 10 of my neighbors, grocery shopping about 11 minutes from my house on a beautiful May afternoon a couple years ago, only because they're black. And he was radicalized with the messaging online. And that is something we all have to be careful about. It's, it's not just what we hear out here, it's what's happening underground. And that's why in the state of New York, I've deployed, I've tripled the number of, of cyber analysts watching for trends and, and hate speech and trying to connect the dots before something horrible happens. And so we, he, I don't know how to explain him other than we must make sure that the Trump era ends on election day and he is banished from political discourse. That's what we have a moral responsibility to do. Absolutely. Maybe he was right about one thing, that the Jewish vote uh, can be the reason he's defeated in November. Um, since October 7th, we have seen an exponential rise in anti-Semitism. It is startling and deeply concerning, including in many New York neighborhoods, communities with large Jewish populations. This issue is also at the forefront of many, many Jewish parents' minds as their students return to campus around the country, including many of your universities here in New York that saw anti-Semitic and anti-Israel protests and encampments earlier this year. So you've mentioned a few, but if you could outline for us the steps that you are taking to ensure the safety and security of the Jewish community here in New York. I will tell you this, it's not new since October 7th. I mean, other than it's going back for thousands of years, I will, in New York State, at the end of September last year, weeks before October 7th, I convened a gathering of experts to talk about the rise of anti-Semitism in the state of New York. We did a, a whole, whole symposium on this over at the, Jew, uh, the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And we talked about the definition of anti-Semitism my commitment to putting more resources behind security for synagogues and yeshivas and cultural centers, $139 million, which is quadrupled the number before, uh, adding more police, state police, and also making sure we're embedded in the Joint Terrorism Task Force. So, you know, there's, again, connecting the dots. I, my husband was a United States attorney under Barack Obama, so I know this from watching him, the law enforcement side of it is so important. Mm -hmm. But also, the education component. We had a number of Holocaust survivors there. And I talked to them. Obviously, they're, they're elderly now. And one woman said to me, she goes, I'm seeing the signs that were there when I was a little girl. I'm seeing it. I'm feeling it now again. And I just thought that was so deeply troubling because these are people who had their childhood stolen from them. I mean, the, the, the pain and the travesty of growing up without their grandparents and their families are split up and they, you know, they just, just, I can't even fathom that experience. But to have anybody who had their childhood stolen from them have to spend their, their later years, their final years, with that same fear coming back in the United States of America, not in Europe, but in the United States of America, I just said, we're going to protect you. We're going to protect you. 
So this has been a personal cause of mine. As you know, I went to Israel right after October 7th. I was one of the first elected officials from this country. I said I have to go there and witness and be someone who can come back and verify what happened because I knew there were others who would deny. They would just say it didn't happen, and I need to be able to stand here as the governor of the state of New York and say, no, I saw it. I went to Kafar Aza. I saw the blood on the walls. I could still smell it. It was still fresh. I know what happened in those safe rooms to those girls. And it is something that has seared my soul in a way I can never banish those memories. And I don't want to, because I don't want my voice to ever be diminished in my responsibility to call this out. And then to see, in my own state, the rise of anti-Semitism in the aftermath, when there should have been the exact opposite response. There should have been a collective condemnation by everybody. Because... Members of the Jewish community have always stood for the causes, whether it's women's rights movement, whether it was you know, the, the freedom right. Was, those are young Jewish kids who were killed when they went to the South to try and secure the right to vote and freedoms uh, for black Americans. So they've always been there on the progressive movements. This is who we are. And to be abandoned at this time, which is what so many felt, like they're in this alone, I said, I'm not abandoning you. So college campuses, to see that rise in anti-Semitism and hatred toward kids just going to school, uh, starting particularly in the spring. Even the Cornell experience where, you know, I just come back, I don't know if you knew the story, but my father had a brain hemorrhage when I was on the plane to Israel, and I landed and found out he had passed during the night. And my staff assumed I was going home right away. They started to rebook a ticket, and I said, no, I can't do anything for my father now. I have to stay here and see if I can help people heal and get over this. And I'll tell you, more people helped me f feel consoled than I was able to do for them. People came up to me on the street and tried to comfort me. But a few weeks later, we had come back from my father's funeral late on a Sunday night, and I got word about the online threats against Jewish students at Cornell University. Far, far away from the streets of New York, this place that's bucolic, it's a beautiful place in our state. And parents send their kids there thinking they're in a secure place. And there's someone who's threatening to kill students as they go to classes. So I went up there the next, I said, I called up the Cornell press and I'll see you in the morning, we're having breakfast. And I went to the, the center with the Jewish children, students, that's not children, sorry, I'm a mom. Uh, I went there and sat with them and, and sat with about 20, 30 kids and I said, I'm gonna protect you. And one young man, I said, what can I do for you? And he was, there anything I can do? I had police with me. I had everybody. He said, can we just get some security cameras? Now, I knew procurement rules and RFPs have to go out and it's going to take a long time. And I said, I'm going to run down to Home Depot and get you a bunch of cameras because I, I, we're not waiting for this. And by the end of the week, they had them. And I invited all those students to a Hanukkah celebration at the governor's residence in December. And they all came and uh, I told them I'm going to take care of them because I, as I, like I said, as a parent, you know, I had to be able to assure the other parents. And there were so many parents I knew in New York, or someone had a niece or nephew there. So that was how we dealt with that. That person was arrested, charged with federal crimes, and still sits in jail. But then the explosion of unrest on our campuses here, particularly in the city. I went over to Columbia. You know, what is the plan? What are you doing to keep young people safe? You know, working with NYPD, working with ours. And I also knew the only thing that was good that happened was the school semester ended. Because you know, otherwise, I think it would have just kept going and going. But I knew over the summer we had to prepare. My teams were embedded with campus security, asking, telling every campus they have to have a safety plan, that we are not tolerating any, any discourse that is derogatory toward Jewish students. You cannot say from the river to the sea because you're basically calling for the genocide of the people. And so I wrote this in a letter to every college president, that if you allow this culture to fester, you are in violation of state and federal human rights laws, and I'll make sure they're enforced. And then I gathered all at the end of the summer, uh, I, had a, I had a Zoom call with 200 university presidents, every institution in the state of New York. And I said, this is how it's going to be. And I want people expelled. I want the threat of expulsion up there. And do, be tougher about this. Because, yes, we want young people to understand free speech, but there's time, place, and manner restrictions, which you expect to have. 
You cannot trample on someone else's rights. And I know things are, I mean, things are calmer than we expected now. I will not say mission accomplished because we have October 7th right before us. So we have enhanced our daily meetings, working with NYPD, working with police all over the state. And uh, we've asked all the universities to be prepared for that day. I think it's going to be a challenging one. I think there'll be a lot of uh, vigils and there'll be counter protests against that. So um, we're fully expecting a lot of activity on that day. But my hope is that these young people and those who you know, feel the right to protest understand that I protest. I mean, I, I'm a Syracuse University grad. I had a lot of friends from the city. We protest at everything, believe me. I was a Democrat, you know, we just protest. But, but we never made it personal. We never hurt someone. I protested the government. I protested my university administration. We never made it personal against another student or made them feel uncomfortable or unwelcome. You cannot do that. That is a line we should not cross. And I will say that I believe Donald Trump brought us to that line that after he got elected, what he was able to say and get away with, how he denigrated people with disabilities, people of color, and the Jewish people, everything. He thinks he can get away with anything, and I think others do as well. And that's where they feel like the wheels have come off. And I want him gone so he can put the wheels back on, have civil discourse, respect differences of opinions, and get back to a, a, an era that this country deserves to have. And I believe we can get back to it. I really do. I've not given up on this. Thank you. A little more about that threat posed by Donald Trump. Um, Project 2025 is a 920-page plan to attack our values, our democracy, in a potential second Trump term. And it's based in extremist policies, like dismantling the government agencies that have been set up to combat hate crimes, stripping away separation of church and state, cutting funding for social services and safety nets, and really just attacking our fundamental rights. It includes the biblical definition of marriage and calls for the elimination of the Department of Education. Uh, it, it, it includes the weakening of the FBI and other law enforcement agencies, which of course serve as a necessary resource against the hate crimes we've been discussing it poses a unique danger to so many of us, including the Jewish community. And that's why we are doing this work to make sure that Jewish voters are aware of this distinct and acute threat. What do you think about the threat? There's so much in there posed by Project 2025. And what can we do in particular to safeguard our democracy? Because even if Donald Trump loses on November 5th, he's already set the stage to not accept that loss, just as he still hasn't accepted the, the fact that he lost by over 7 million votes in 2020. You asked the most comprehensive questions, Haley, so, so let me break that down. Let me break that down. Starting with the book that uh, enshrines what is known as Project 2025, I tend to not support banning books. I tend not to support book burnings, but that one should be trashed and burned right now. Uh, let's just... And any Republican who supports Donald Trump, or you know, as we focus back on Congress again for a minute, or Senator, anyone who supports Donald Trump, like the Republicans who have endorsed... All the Republicans in New York State in Congress have endorsed Donald Trump. They're endorsing that as well. That is their platform. And don't let them say it is not, because you have also have the ability to say, no, I'm not going with Donald Trump. I'm an independent thinking Republican. There's nothing I miss more than a, the old school Republican Party that was there when I worked as an attorney for Senator Moynihan back in a different era, back in the 80s. And so I, how we deal with that book is to use it against them. They gave us the playbook on how to defeat them, because there's always going to be a constituency Turn to any page you want. You know, labor unions, labor unions would not exist. Programs for seniors that keep them out of poverty back in the 60s before they came up, before Democrats uh, put in place Medicare, seniors were the largest population group in poverty. Now they're 
the most affluent, not affluent, but they're the most successful in terms of their health outcomes because we have programs like that. So they want to turn back the clock to a time that is unrecognizable to us, and all we have to do is use that against them. Use your voice as the platform, this organization, and the resources you have, but don't just stop at beating up Donald Trump over it. Take it all the way down and use that to weaponize against uh, all the candidates running with the Republican mantle this year because that's how we're going to defeat them. Education is everything. Everybody watching MSNBC in the morning, you know what Project 25 is. I don't know if everybody out on the street here does. People in the, in the restaurants and the diners and on the subways, I don't know if they know about it. That's a responsibility we have is to educate us the dangers of what they will do. They were dumb enough to put it in writing and it's time to show how dumb they are and banish them because of that book as well. But on the issue of democracy specifically, what steps have been taken here in New York to ensure that every vote is counted and that we can defend and safeguard our elections? Uh, we have had so many meetings on this. I have a Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Services. We just had a briefing this afternoon uh, with everybody from you know, my cyber chief to our police, our police department. Everybody is involved in working with the elections commissioners, making sure they have the training they need, and the volunteers, the, the Democratic lawyers who volunteer to be the ones who, you know, the challenges come up at different polling places, they have to be able to handle it. We're even looking at everything. If there's a cyber attack and our power goes down and the, election, and the Board of Elections is shut down or the polling places are shut down, I tell you, we tabletop everything. I'm amazed I can sleep at night because my team is so smart to game out all the doomsday bad scenarios that could happen. But you know why we do that? So we're ready for them. We will not be surprised here in the state of New York, and we will fight hard to protect this. Now, other states, I can't speak for them, uh, especially the ones that are Republican-leaning. And thank God you know, the Secretary of State was not intimidated in Georgia. But imagine if he had been. Imagine if he had been. We'd be in a very dark and different place now. So we take it very seriously here in the state of New York. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I've received a few questions, so I'm incorporating some of your questions into these as well. I mentioned this earlier, but we know that abortion justice and reproductive rights is a Jewish value, and we're working to elect candidates who will codify Roe and protect access to critical reproductive care like IVF, and support the Health Protection Act, which would codify abortion rights, and make sure that our elected officials know that abortion access is a top priority for Jewish voters. So you mentioned this, while abortion is protected here in New York, if Republicans win, Congress particularly, they could implement a national abortion ban that strips all of us, even blue states, even here in New York, of our reproductive rights. So how should we talk about this issue and communicate the urgency of electing Democrats specifically to protect our bodily autonomy and our reproductive rights? Well, first of all, let me ask a question. How many of you know that there's a constitutional amendment on the ballot this November that would enshrine the right to an abortion in the state of New York? You all, everybody know that? I'm really happy to see that. But do all your friends know that? Do all your neighbors know that? Do everybody at your, your workplace know that? Because what the Republicans are trying to do is weaponize this again because it talks about gender equality and they're trying to put it into a whole different place and demonize it and try to get people to vote against it. So we cannot be caught off guard on this because this is our fail-safe way to handle this, that we enshrine it in our Constitution. Now, they can pass an abortion ban, but what I'd have the ability to go to court and say, Donald Trump said this is for states, right? States' rights. My Constitution says it's a, it's a constitutional right here in the state of New York because the voters have spoken. So that's why we're leaning so hard into this. We need more help to get the word out. I need more resources for advertising and campaigning on this. Uh, we are doing that, but it's also we're trying to win back the House at the same time. But they go together. I believe that people, even independents uh, and suburban Republican moms who care about these rights, not for them, many of them, it's for your daughters. It's your daughters. It's your nieces. It's uh, you know, other people. And again, the whole issue of now seeing the, the, the stories that could just make you cry when you hear about these young women in other states who 
You know, the, even the ones who take the medication-assisted abortion, which is 50% of abortions, they're no longer surgical. Half of them are medication-assisted treatment. But if something goes wrong and you go to into the hospital, like Amber, the 28-year-old down in Georgia, you know, she, all she needed was a doctor to understand that you know, her body was shutting down over this, that she needed help, and they wouldn't do it because they were afraid of being prosecuted. What I did in the immediate aftermath of, well, actually before the Dobbs decision, before, before it was overturned, when they tell, remember they leaked the memo that said they were going to go that way? Mm -hmm. Who does that? Uh, even before we got the decision, we'd already changed the law in New York State. Number one, to protect doctors who may be prescribing medication-assisted abortion to out-of-state uh, patients, or if someone comes into our state because I declared that we are a safe harbor for people, we are a safe harbor for their rights, that they're protected, they cannot be extradited to another state. I also knew that we're gonna have higher volume. I'm from Buffalo. We're only, a, we're not far from Ohio. I mean, it takes me less time to get to Cleveland than it does to drive from Buffalo to New York City. So we knew that we'd be a place that women seeking this, this, these medical services, their right to have these medical services, would be perhaps overflowing our clinics. And so I put $35 million right off the bat uh, on to, you know, to help all of them expand their services. And other, you know, we had a whole series of protections that we, we, we enacted immediately. I said, I, have to, I cannot wait a second. We're going to do that. So that is what we do with this governor sitting here. I will tell you the individual I was running against a couple of years ago, you could not count on that. So even New York State, when everybody thought you could never touch it, he said he would have a pro-life health commissioner. You know what that means? Everything I just described to you would not happen. You would not have protections. None of these protections would exist. So, so don't even be fooled by those Republicans who are telling you, no, no, I'm, forget my record. I really didn't mean that. I'm all about women now because I start seeing my career going down the tubes. Uh, that's what's happening in these races. So people can't be fooled by these ads that they're running now because they see the writing on the wall. They saw the Swazi election. They see what's happening elsewhere. They see the tide is turning because this is no longer a hypothetical threat like it was when Donald Trump first ran, he actually, the only promise he kept was to take away the right to an abortion. Give him credit. He promised he'd do it. He was going to get a Supreme Court that would strip those rights away, and he did it. So now it's no longer, I wonder if that would happen. It happened, my friends. It already happened, and people are dying because of that. And Republicans who support Donald Trump, you own that as well. Use it against them. I love campaigns, and we can go on offense. You know, I've been on defense on too many elections. You've got to go on offense. So, uh, so let's, that's how we do it. That's how we do it. So it is on all of us to ensure that we elect Democrats up and down the ballot on November 5th. And we are continuing our work each day between now and the election. We work 24-6. We take the Sabbath off. But we work 24-6 with with uh, phone banks, text banks, uh, in battleground states and swing districts. We know that each day matters, and there are 41 left. Um, and every volunteer can make the difference. What do you, what's your message to everyone in this room about what we can all do to help shape the outcome of this election? We are not a presidential battleground state. I think it'd be kind of fun if we were. We'd see a lot more of the candidates coming through, but I can live with this. We are a battleground state for the House of Representatives. The nation is watching us. So as much fun as it is, is, and we used to do this in the past, we get on the buses to go to other states for Hillary or for Barack Obama and for Joe Biden. The only bus I'm letting you get on is to go out to Hudson Valley, maybe up to Syracuse or over to Long Island. If you want to be there in person to protect your nation and your democracy, I need you to help us win the House of Representatives. Focus intensely on that. I need the bodies. I need the resources. I need the help for the state party so I can do even more. And that's what it is. And you're already doing everything. I can't tell you anything to do anything differently because you and this incredible organization know how to win elections because you already have. So just keep that up as well and know the we response. We hope everyone we joins us. Yeah, we well, have buses. Yes, yes. I can, I can, I've covered every inch of this state. I can get on the bus with you, and I know all the directions. I don't even need GPS. I know how to get to these places. So, so that's how we're going to win it, because it's, you know, 
touching people directly. I can't, I got elected by going to 50,000 homes personally and knocking on the door with a couple of toddlers. And somehow they always had to go to the restroom or they were thirsty and they're crabby, but I dragged them out there. It's how I got elected. So it's about touching people at the door because they don't expect it. They can, you know, not pick up a phone or they can ignore a text. They see you knocking on their door because you're so passionate about this. You can win them over with the story. Tell them, be the truth tellers. That's what we have to do. And if we don't do that, my friends, we're going to do a lot of explaining to our kids and grandkids when they say, you know, Grandma, Grandpa, where were you? What happened? We've seen this play out with devastating consequences in other countries. Um, we can't let that happen to our country. It is worth fighting for. And I know you are. You're in this fight with us. So thank you. Thank you so much, Governor. We so appreciate it. Thank you. I know you have to go. Thank you so much. I also want to say there were a few questions about Israel and some other issues, and JDCA has talking points and resources and advertising. Our website, jewishstems.org, please do go visit. One question in particular that I, I, I really do want to answer specifically was, what do we say to our friends and neighbors who have questions about Kamala Harris's record on Israel? Because I can speak to this personally. I think it was mentioned in the intro. I was her national security advisor in the Senate. I traveled to Israel with Kamala Harris. I know for a fact, because I saw it firsthand, her commitment to Israel's security, its right to self-defense, her commitment to the U.S.-Israel relationship is ironclad. This was before she entered this White House. And under this White House, which has gone to great lengths, not only to unequivocally condemn the horror that we saw on October 7th, but to stand with Israel in the aftermath of this attack. She has demanded the release of the hostages. She has been a part of this administration's efforts to provide $14.3 billion in additional aid to Israel to ensure that it has everything that it needs to defend itself, to deploy U.S. military assets three times since October 7th in the aftermath into the Red Sea on, a, on April 13th when we saw an unprecedented attack from Iran on Israel. And most recently in August, this administration, President Biden and Vice President Harris, deployed the U.S. military to ensure Israel had the ability to defend itself and also to aid in Israel's defense. So this administration and Vice President Harris have stood with Israel. And she has said repeatedly, including on the debate stage and the stage that we all saw her on in Chicago, about her staunch commitment to these issues, there is no question in my mind, it should be no question in anyone else's mind where she stands on these issues. We also have talking points for when you speak to your friends, your neighbors, your voters. We are all surrogates. So please do this work with us in the next 41 days. And thank you so much, Governor Hochul, for your support.